wig was one of the most important rituals of the Vedic era. It was the highest expression of royal authority. It was the goal of the acquisition of power, glory, the sovereignty over the neighboring provinces, and the general prosperity of the kingdom. One cannot but draw parallels between Ashwamedh and Prime Minister Narendra Modi's quest to make India into a 20 trillion dollar economy. For the first time in decades, hope has sprung for the teething masses. Bold goal posts are being set. Foreign diplomacy is being reset. New economic milestones are being targeted. And there is an urgency like never before. Prime Minister Modi's audacious target of housing for all by 2022 the passage of GST along with demonetization exercise to formalize and lift the economy, the quest for simultaneous elections to the parliament and the state assemblies, the recent ruling on Triple Talaq, the constitutional challenge to the Article 35A are all set to redefine India's creature, character, and the heart permanently. The elephant has begun to move, and this is the moment of the Indian Renaissance. To discuss this and more, we invite you to Ashwamed Elara India Dialogue 
जहाज में दो तरह के बैगेज होते हैं एक चेक टीन एक हैंड बैग इसको तुम हैंड बैगेज की तरह ले जा सकते हो Actually, let's go. Uh, there was uh, 
lines, you have uh, the drug manufacturers, you have this is dead secret. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, start with a specific overview. Uh, I think we have one hour and fifty minutes uh, allotted. Uh, this will be a very exciting one, so please just uh, sit back and relax and uh, enjoy the time. Uh, just a quick overview before we start. Uh, I think uh, very much anyway given a good uh, background, and also we saw this very emotional film. Uh, that's exactly what uh, this Ashwamed is trying to do. Uh, it's, uh, the revolution has sort of started, and we have to just take it forward. Uh, and, and the lady and the gentleman sitting here uh, on the stage are some of the uh, people at the forefront who are, who are doing it. Now, uh, I, I remember about uh, this was 2010, about maybe seven years back, uh, it was at an airport conference in London uh, where I had the opportunity to share thoughts. And uh, at that time, we, uh, we projected that uh, by 2020, India has the potential to be number three and uh, number one uh, by 2030. And I could see half the people sniggering, half of them actually fell off the chair because we were at a very, uh, I mean, at number 10 or number 11, uh, a very small traffic level. And they were just a little amused to see somebody coming from India making such a, such a bombastic statements. But uh, uh, now, as I say, facts speak for themselves. And uh, today, <coughs> we're actually number four, and a very close number four to Japan. And hopefully by Diwali, if not by Dashera, we'll actually overtake Japan to be the number three. And big round of applause for you, because you make it. You are the ones who fly and make us worth a while. And of course, to the people sitting on the stage, uh, Together, we are making this Ashwamed uh, happen. And this is actually three years before uh, the projection we had made. And at that time, uh, of course, uh, in 2010, nobody would predict that in 2015, suddenly oil prices will crash from 110 uh, to down to less than $40 at that time. And uh, a new revolution will be born. It was based more on the, the basic fundamentals of the new economy, the demographics, and the way things were going, the way the economy is moving. And uh, by that, uh, uh, in fact, in 2008, we actually had a recession as well. So based on all those multiple factors, we, that prediction was made and we are happy to report that actually we might touch the number three, three years before that. Now the next foolish dream is to be number one by 2030 and of course the road is going to be very tough, it's not going to be easy. And, uh, but then they say, unless your dreams are uh, silly and laughable, it's no, not a dream, it's just a simple consultant-ish uh, projection <coughs> using the past as a trend. Now I, I like, we like the title uh, when we first discussed it, India will fly. Because many people feel India is flying, but it's not. Uh, if you look at the uh, middle class population of 350 odd million, uh, forget the rest, just the 350 million middle class people, it will just fly once in a year uh, and then fly back. We're talking about 350 plus 350, 700 million. If you can just make a middle class fly once in a year, and there are many discount schemes going around, and if you just do a Delhi Bombay Google right now, 15 days hence, uh, the tickets is below 3,000 rupees, which was which is less than what we paid 20 years back when I was a, or maybe 30 years back when I was a student here in the city itself. So, I guess things are moving. And if you can uh, just do these 350 plus 700 million, uh, we'll be beyond China and then we'll uh, be very close to US because they're not growing at the same speed at which we are. But unfortunately, how much, uh, how much traffic did we get last year? About 100 billion. This is one seventh of the potential that we have. So, this is a simple maths. We don't want to you with uh, too much of Econometric projections, something just commonsensical numbers. Uh, last year was uh, very exciting. We had uh, lots of uh, policy initiatives like the uh, NCAP, the National Civil Division Policy 2016, was released in uh, June last year. This is the first time in 70 years we actually have a policy. Because once you have a policy, at least you can refer to it as a, as a reference medium, you can react to it, you can criticize it, you can mock it, you can make fun of it. But at least there's something to, to, to fight against. Okay. For 70 years we never had a policy, so it actually depended on which side the minister or the secretary got off the bed to determine his mood of the day, whether it's code shares or, or 5 by 20 or uh, airport policies or airline policies. Today we have a policy and from here the policy will only improve uh, as it's happening. Then there's Uran, which is chapter 1 of uh, uh, RCS because the Prime Minister's dream was to take a Hawaii chapel guy into a Hawaii jahaz. So uh, that was the brief. So when uh, we were part of the drafting uh, and the 22 chapter, the first chapter, the biggest chapter is on visual connectivity. I'm so glad to see it actually happening. And uh, if you saw uh, earlier this year, we had a Prime Minister of the country going to flag off a small plane with just 14 passengers off Shimla. That was the first flight. And never before in 70 years have we seen a Prime Minister go and flag off a 
small plane with 14 people. In fact, the Prime Minister's entire security paraphernalia would be five times of, of that number. Uh, they're talking about Air India to be privatized twice. We've tried in the past, uh, uh, in, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and we've almost come to that stage uh, uh, where uh, we kind of should have happened, but unfortunately, it did. It's politics and, and various things which we're not aware of uh, happened, and uh, it, it was taken off. And in that process, we've only wasted another 26 or 27,000 crores of taxpayers' money. For the first time, we're seeing a government taking that bold, uh, uh, the bull by its horns and saying, we'll get off it because it's not the government's job to fly planes. The government's job is to govern, regulate, monitor, punish, reward, but not to fly planes. So that, that's, that's a great movement forward. And uh, last but not the least, uh, there's this big focus on Make in India, and we'll of course turn to Ajay Mehra to share his thoughts from Airbus, Airbus, Boeing, Lockheed, all the big ones under this whole Make in India strategic partnership model. Uh, both defense and uh, commercial aerospace go hand in hand because there are a lot of commonalities there, and the players are the same. So we're seeing that, that also as a big push, and uh, uh, I'll leave it to the panelists to talk about it. Then we have this great uh, uh, growth uh, situation. Uh, growth always comes with, uh, with, with challenges, uh, just like uh, uh, unprecedented growth, uh, which was actually not expected, triggered by this oil price uh, uh, fall. And uh, so on infrastructure, on ease of doing business, taxation, and also talent, because uh, there's just not enough talent which is being created to, to, to leverage this great uh, uh, grow. And that again is something which we'll be uh, talking to our uh, panelists. Uh, one or two things we'll be careful about is that we'll not go too, too much of government passion because unfortunately neither in the panel nor in the audience do we have anyone from the government. And sitting in Mumbai, we're far away from uh, Delhi where the seat of the government is. Uh, so, uh, and for the first time as we saw and we discussed just now, government is actually working very closely with us. So it's up to us to, to take our, our ideas to the government and we see a great audience and a great uh, <coughs> what do you say, uh, appreciation of, of the challenges and that, that is again another thing which I request the panelists to share their experiences of how policy making government is, uh, uh, interaction with the government is happening. And uh, we, we focus more on solutions rather than uh, problems because everybody in this room is highly educated and uh, aware. So we will not talk more about the problems but more about what we as industry leaders uh, need to do. Uh, last part is we also keep it very interactive so all those at the back who might be doing some box happening Please be careful because if you don't volunteer, we'll force you to ask questions. So with those few words, I'll just uh, quickly move on uh, to the panel. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in fact, uh, the panel I noticed uh, is almost like a very famous citizen of the city who used to say, kaka 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 Kiran. We start with Kiran, we have four Ks <laughs> on the stage. And Ajay, Kiran, you, you've seen it all, you've been part of this whole infrastructure. So when we say infrastructure, taxation, talent, uh, shortage, ease of doing business, I think you've, you've struggled against all. Just share some of the things, initiatives that you're taking, and going forth, what do we do to harness the best out of this growth momentum that is set up with this 17 to 18 percent growth? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Abdul. Uh, um, my present role is in finance. I work in good finance and corporate But I started, I uh, um, had the opportunity to start. Uh, with the first Greenfield Airport, and I have seen the growth personally myself from 1999. Really good first airport, really good second uh, airport, which is really in Mumbai, then really good global airports. So I have seen this entire growth, and they started with five people. So uh, before this airport sector, I used to look after corporate finance also. So, I, uh, so my father said, Why don't you build things rather than advising? So I started. Uh, building teams with five people. So when I rotated myself into this role, the new role, uh, I ended up with five people. It's been a great journey. I think uh, we've seen the, from the government regulations, we've seen from the aviation growth, the new airlines, we've seen airlines, I've seen I mean, uh, the videos, given us some memories of the air that how the entire uh, uh, air traffic has really grown in uh, between 2004 and 2008. Uh, and then we've seen after 2008, the traffic coming down after 2008 and the struggles uh, I've personally gone through and I'm sure, you know, Kapil was uh, part of us, we started looking at how can we start regional connectivity out of high You know, when the traffic was down, I mean, traffic was down almost like 20% during that uh, tough phase. And now again we're seeing the growth, we're seeing the growth from 2014 onwards. I think a lot of uh, interesting uh, journey we've gone through. Um, I think the way, uh, the first phase has been, uh, I guess, is uh, getting the regulations in place. And I remember uh, we got we were shortlisted uh, as a preferred bidder for Hyderabad in 2001. And we found out that uh, the government is shortlisted, but government act does 
have been changed to private vehicles. So that's why in the, that's why it took two years for the act to change, 2001-2003, the act changed. Then we signed the agreement. So we started with that journey. And uh, we've taken a lot of time getting the infrastructure in place uh, and, uh, and getting it financed. Uh, those are the challenges. Uh, I think that the new regulators come in 2009. The earnings of 2009. Some of the point, and we 
you've seen, uh, I might have personally seen the regulations also. They put regulations, have, I would say, reasonably stabilized. And uh, there's a lot of uh, understanding, a lot of engagement between the airport sector and the regulator, uh, understanding the, the nuances of the regulations. And we've got some stability. And a few more issues are there, which I'm sure we will be able to address in the next uh, 12 months to 18 months uh, in the airport sector. And they have come up with a policy where all the greenfield projects, future projects will be hybrid, which is uh, conducive for growth, conducive for growth uh, for the airport sector. And, uh, and some of these are some of my questions. Uh,
this one was built for an RCS, now it's been adapted to the RCS. It is sustainable. Uh, let's put it this way. It's exactly like the way you saw when we started off the aviation panel. Right? We start with this map. That's, that's the idea of the model. But then, when you see the whole picture, when you saw the whole YouTube video, left with you the sweet taste. That feel good factor is there when you get in the aircraft. The idea about Indian aviation is all about that. The moment you start off, you see there are multiple snacks, which can be related to authorities, etc. etc. It's not that. Things have changed. Things have completely changed now. Uh, the government is very, very pro aviation. The numbers are increasing. Uh, I would second what Ambar has given the numbers. By Diwali or maybe uh, by end of December, you should, we might see a 24% growth, which is never heard anywhere in the globe. Thanks to RCS, thanks to new aircrafts coming in, thanks to the policy of uh, RCS, which has pushed the airline like Indigo to go into the regional aircraft. Right. They are placed in order for 50 ATRs. Who could have thought Indigo, a single 320 operator, moving into that? So there is, there is a huge amount of growth coming up. What really needs to be done is plugging on the massive is there, the big airports, Mumbai, Delhi, completely chock a block. Uh, there is uh, no position as far as the air side is controlled, not, not as far as the terminal is controlled. Uh, we need to work with companies like Air Authority of India and decongest the airports. Then only this RCS will really happen. We keep on speaking about RCS, which means from the IQ space to the IQ space, which is not exactly the truth. Every smaller city, People, businessmen, need to come to Mumbai, Delhi, Hyderabad, Mumbai, or let's face it, or Kolkata, and go back from there. The business is there. So what, what was happening, a city like Durgapur, which I fly, we found that the people of Durgapur was not talking about going to Durgapur to Bukhara. That's not RCS. RCS is bringing people from Durgapur to Delhi and Mumbai in the least possible time. Or getting from here, a small city from here, in the western part of the country to bring it to Mumbai or to Pune. How do we do that? We decongest the airports. We have a huge business aviation in the country which is going. I think is here. She is King Leon. She is the Uber of business aviation. That's Eva. I just want to tell But you cannot have business aviation built up in a Mumbai airport or in the Diyamar Tagal airport. You cannot have 10 slots per hour given or a 5 slots per hour given to a business aircraft which might fly at the home sweet time. That's what business aviation is all about. A corporate person who needs to fly a telegram can come at 11 o'clock and fly to the aircraft is stuck up on the runway itself. They are waiting for the startup and the whole slot goes off. It's not right. In Mumbai today, in the entire business aviation, there are about 64 aircraft parked in Mumbai at different time. Can you move it to Juhu? You can just decongest about nearly 20 slots per hour. We are speaking of 240 slots in a day. It's huge. It makes all the difference. Maybe the need. You know, like I'm going to train people like this, we do want indoor air force base to move the RCS. Why can't we move the business aviation there? Let's say, for example, a bank or airport. If we move the entire business aviation to have, which also makes sense, the people, the businessmen, doesn't want to get into the bank or airport and drive down into the bank or city. It's better to get into the hard airport, which is inside the city, or even high park, the bank or airport. This is the first thing we should do. We can just the airport within our structure. It, is, it doesn't require a huge calculation, numbers, it's common sense. In so so okay. I, I guess uh, the key reason why you can't do that is because you have just so many contracts with the airport developers. So I guess what you're saying in the way uh, the growth is happening and the same question, maybe uh, the government, the stakeholders and the airport operators need to someone like a Kiran or, or the other, other parties need to sit together and find a way so that interests of all parties can get there. Because uh, these are so many contracts. Now, if we suddenly start a HCL airport, Delhi Airport has reached its peak capacity of 75 flights an hour. 
same 20% because the JSF is increasing, and also because almost 45 46 percent of the traffic, even in Hyderabad and Bangalore, actually comes from the to and from Delhi and Mumbai. So, do you see now a trend with your David Watcher and a couple, a couple of others? Uh, do you see more of direct city to city traffic also happening from the state capitals? So, like say someone like a Patna or a Bhopal or Indore or say Chandigarh, these are sort of creators of employees. And a lot of employment because now, unfortunately, left behind the left behind the software story and the manufacturing story. A lot of employment is generated down south in the Hyderabad, Bangalore, and the Chennai. And the you see now more of direct flights from the Lucknow's to the Bangalore's and then Madurai, Chennai. Or because earlier it was all going to most of the Lucknow's or, or Chandigarh's would actually come to Delhi and then fly to the rest of the country or the world. That's exactly what it is. Uh, is that a positive trend? I mean, yeah, that's a very like positive trend. Converting a liability into an asset. Yeah. That's what we've been seeing. We've been seeing the airport. Pune, which is again a very large hub. People coming in all the way from Ranchi and Bhubaneswar to Pune, direct flights coming from Ranchi and Bhubaneswar to Pune, which could have never been thought. People would go all the way to Delhi and direct them to or vice versa. So, this kind of direct flights are done because of the capacity issues which have been covered. This is one area which we should look at. Uh, for increasing the capacity to get the numbers in place, we need to be with just the airport without changing much of the infrastructure. That is what I've been, what I've been um, voicing for months. Uh, that's where the numbers are going to really come in. RCS, the RCS has to make a uh, real impact which has already started off. We all have seen, I think, uh, Mr. Paul is here, you are there. We are seeing more impact happening. This is one major area which we should look at. Right. Let me bring in Kapil now. Kapil, uh, you are one of the foremost experts on, on aviation scene at all. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of those challenges? If you discuss infrastructure, maybe you can talk uh, if you on, the, on the talent side because of the commanders. There's a big now DTC is come up with a one year silly rule with all your respects uh, and uh, also the taxation issues, uh, even ease of doing business while it's improved. But I mean, DTC is still the challenge is there. Your thoughts? So, uh, good morning, Mr. Uh, 
infrastructure and ground infrastructure. I would say there are three, four uh, key issues to, to this. Is one is that manpower infrastructure is a big issue. Uh, pilots are going to be a big problem, and uh, we have this uh, this rule of one year, uh, which Amber mentioned. That's going to further impact airlines, get them to uh, get costly form pilots, and that's going to change the cost per block of our pilots significantly. Uh, so the manpower, whether it's related to uh, pilots, especially commanders, there are almost at the present moment 3,000 ATCA shortages. You talk about AMEs and then you look at the whole value chain. I think the manpower infrastructure shortage is my assessment of a big challenge. We have always seen that when the GDP growth is about 6% across the economy, uh, the shortages of manpower become a value. So if you're trying to grow at about 7-8% of the manpower is, is pretty good. Third, I would say the institutional infrastructure. I keep, I will re-emphasize this again and again, that if we don't, if we are not set up to manage this growth, whether it's related to safety, whether it's related to security, whether it is related to creating a policy and regulatory architecture which is supporting this growth, uh, there I think then we will have shortcomings. I think infrastructure may be, we, we can use technology, sweat analysis, and simultaneously push for building green field airports. I am more worried about the ability of the institutional infrastructure and the competence to manage a complex industry like that, which is going to be about 50%. In addition to that, the cost and ease of doing business is fundamental towards making sure that you get qualified investors into the system uh, as aggressively as you would want. We have the taxation which is punitive if you go and we can debate about it. The whole value chain of cost on aviation is extremely high. With the result that the cost of uh, Producing an aviation output is not compensated by fair inputs. So that's one part. And ease of doing business. Uh, in one year pilot rule, I don't know what it does to RCS. Uh, if government is promoting RCS on one hand and then saying that I will go one year, I don't know what it means. If the ease of doing business at the DGCA becomes more and more uh, a structural problem, I don't know what it does to RCS and, 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 uh, and, and the overall growth of this country. Having said that, I have said this again and again. The intent of this government is extremely consultative and very proactive. The institution is not set up to succeed, uh, whether in terms of expertise, expertise, and the qualifying dynamics that are required to manage the sector. So I think it's up to us as an industry. Uh, government can do a bit, uh, but as an industry to be more proactive in terms of providing the dynamic which will allow this 15-20% consistently. Thereby what government in number keeps mentioning about that, about growth, and jobs. And if you don't just get these uh, bottlenecks removed, aviation continues, will continue to be suboptimal in some Sure, thanks so much. Uh, that was a very uh, brilliant overview of the system. What we'll do is we'll take a quick break and uh, let's take about two, three questions. It's time to be a little bit more interactive, otherwise it'll get a little boring before we come to the, the real stars. Any, any questions? Yeah, they can. Somebody get a mic right in front, uh, so the chain doesn't need a mic. No, 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 no. Uh, for the benefit of uh, people in the back. Uh, three short questions and then we'll again we start the conversation. Yes, it is. On a five year back, when China was growing very fast as an economy, we were saying that this economy is becoming among the second fastest economy in the world. But there is no bread from China. Times have changed. Now you are seeing the brands coming. When we replicate the same model on Indian aviation sector, we realize that this is again becoming one of the fastest growth sector in the world. In the world. But we are not seeing the airline brands coming up. Uh, I was traveling to you know, Turkey a few days back, and Turkish airline had number of aircraft which is more than top three airline in India. When do you see that? How far we are, the Indian airline will be among the top in the world. Sure, so I will try to to Kostal or address that. Uh, should we first just uh, gather all the growth that we can and then go into branding? Or should we brand today and hope that growth will fall? Uh, I would support this word in such a way that you know, like every economy, wherever we have seen uh, aviation as a leader, a brand emerges. There to be Singapore, uh, Singapore Airlines became a brand to the city itself, to the country itself. Uh, today, I mean, a real, real sweet brand, I mean, uh, on the Asian Shindigo, let's face it, it is there, it is there somewhere. 
uh, doing it right the way it should be. Uh, we accept it or we don't accept it uh, with a pinch of salt. It is a brand. It's a global brand. When we look into the aviation sector, we look into the manufacturer, uh, aircraft manufacturers everywhere. Indigo is a large force. Uh, brands will emerge. It's going to happen. The consolidation is happening. There are two more forerunners into the slots of number two and number three. It's going to happen. It, uh, it, India, the aviation was never been a sunshine sector until a few years back and the focus has come back. Brands will come. And uh, at the same time, what Amar was saying, uh, the regrouping is happening. Uh, RCS itself is becoming a brand and from there some brands will come out. You'll be surprised to see that. Uh, it's, we are just on the right path. Uh, Indigo is one round into the funding has happened, the second round is coming up. You will see a large brand called Indigo, which yes. is fine. Sure. Uh, any other question? Yeah. In fact, just before you say that, I, I think uh, there are two different schools of thought, Jaydeo. I, I, I don't want to drag the conversation, but uh, if you look at any major brand, whether it's the, the, the Google, the Ubers, or nothing in the name, nothing in the brands, actually the, the strategy that they follow, the processes, the people, and the way they went about the business. I'll just give a last example of Emirates, uh, way back in the, I think, the, uh, the mid 80s, when they started, they started out of a pain that Gunfair was actually uh, ignoring uh, Dubai because they, they were treating that as a micro. They started with two planes on loan, a guess from whom? A uh, friendly neighbor's Pakistan. So they got these two old planes from Pakistan International Airlines and just so see in the last 30 years where they've gone from where to where. So brand sort of builds on its own. I think the key thing is to get the fundamentals right and the brand may happen later. But again, it's a very sensitive subject. We could go on and on on that. Yes, please, let me know. You just speak a little louder, please. Yeah, we are all old people, little hard yeah. hearing, you have to just keep it. <laughs> so you are talking about the limitation to the busiest airport, Delhi, Bombay, and at the same time you are putting up the number of people, the number of people, the number of people, how these two things can coexist at the same time? It's a lot of process. So, um, Bombay potentially has some little bit of capacity left, the time to invest in. I don't think terminal is a problem, their side is a problem, and they have been marketed in terms of certain uh, their side is but there is a limitation that they are more world uh, more disclosed. Delhi has a short term problem, which they are trying to solve by shifting their lines to D2. But in the next three years, they should have capacity to should take care of getting one goal for five, five to seven years. But the 15 radiation goal will mean that these 400 aircraft will come in. We will go to Patna, we will go to Lakhna, we will go to Bhubaneswar, we will go to we will go to Jaipur, Raipur. And the spread is going to be deep and wide, as Delhi Bombay is suggested. And uh, till these airports in, in the airport authority has capacity to take these aircraft, uh, we would see that the next five years will be able to absorb. The problem is that if you go at 15%, next five years entire AI non-metro airports of AI will be joined. Uh, and if you go at 15%, my assessment then most of the metro airports will also be going significantly. So I don't see a problem for the next five years. But if you were to say that we want to provide 15% if that's our potential, what will happen in after 5 years, what will happen after 10 years, 15 years? Because India is a landlocked country, acquisition of land in China is itself becoming a problem. So if you don't plan that lasts a generation and the uh, entire state, uh, the regional economies are integrated, you will have a problem. But 15 20% is based on the fact that the 2400 aircraft are going and those will be spread around because the airport authority is making up about 150 parking bays. Uh, once the new airport infrastructure is built, I think for the five years will have, you, you will be okay, but it's a question of what you do beyond that. I think for the for our airports, uh, Delhi and Dubai. Delhi, uh, in 2006, when we built, our uh, planning was 100 million passengers per annum. Recently, we updated the master planning. We can go up to 120 million passengers. That's how we are going every year and they are putting the cameras. In Hyderabad, I think the, the government has planned it very well, we have 5,000 acres. We can go to 60 to 80 million passengers. So these two are but I think the other primary also can handle the capacity the same thing. But in the same division, if you plan ahead, I think the city of Chennai and other cities, they have to plan for future. A minimum of 5,000 acres, then you can plan it very well. The other thing is the, the most important thing I see is the connectivity from the city to the airport. The most, I think we're going to face 
lot of issues even in Delhi are connected with connecting the city by the metro, by multiple routes. That is the going to be the biggest uh, challenge you already see going to Bangalore uh, or some other cities. So, you know, just reading from whatever you just said, I mean, if you look at you as the massive transportation network that they have, land, air, sea, metros, etc., etc., they have one ministry called airport. They have only 15 cabinet ministers plus the voters. Do you think we, in India we see that because here for all the four modes of transportation we see four different ministries and then there is the urban municipality which actually is supposed to do the last mile etc. Do you ever foresee India having one ministry of transportation? I think uh, it is going to be because of the growth that we are going to have, I think we will be compelled to move in that direction because what is happens is we all, I think our, we all react to situations, the way we work. So I think we are going to see that trend. We are going to see a coordinated effort. Like I think they already done in, uh, in the Ministry of Shipping, uh, in the highways, and ports. I think we are going to see the same trend. And because of the kind of, you can't handle fire, 15 percent, 20 percent working, so you have to make changes. And similarly in state level also, you have to make changes. Otherwise, uh, I think we will, I think we are going, going to get that. So let me uh, shift to Karika, a good friend. Uh, she's uh, already the Forbes uh, under 30. Uh, I don't know, let me get some of your age. Yeah, you we'll just come back, we'll just come back. And uh, uh, recently, we had dinner with the uh, Prime Minister, sir. So she's someone whom uh, uh, the Prime Minister also refers to if, she wants, if he wants to understand how do we take India forward. Karika, uh, your thoughts on. See, half the people in this room, actually, how many people want to travel in a business jet someday? That's, that's humbleness at its uh, peak. I think uh, how many the WhatsApp messages is coming in too fast. So anyway, uh, if, if that's your dream, uh, including I think people on the, the stage as well. I think Karika is the one who will do that. She's the Uber of aviation. She's got over maybe 30, 40 aircraft by now. 30, 40 aircraft which are not owned by them. They are owned by various people uh, who find it difficult to manage properly. And then she's the one who consolidates it all. And if you want to go to a place called Tumkur, how many people know where Tumkur is? I guess people from Tamil Nadu will know. But uh, you want to go to Tumkur or Rachi or say uh, a place called Joda Badil, which is the, uh, the manganese ore capital of the country, uh, only 1% can take you to the air, which is KD, Karika, but take you one. Karika, no thoughts on which way are we headed, what are some of the challenges you face, and the way forward. How do we take half these people into private jets and make it cheaper, inshallah, one day? So I think, um, you know, time is largely looked upon as a luxury in our country. For the longest time, the perception has been there for the rich for their holidays and things like that. But um, I think the primary difference between the way people are thinking and ground reality is we are a means to achieve. You know, 0.1% um, of the country's population literally controls the fate of the balance 99.9%. And if you don't enable these 0.1% to perform, they work really hard. You're not going to have the, the growth numbers you want in regional or anywhere else. Because if you want to make the country's GDP grow, if you want to make the economy grow, you've got to have the 0.1% achieve. And this consists of industrialists, politicians, etc. You've got customers who visit four to five plants in one day and they keep, still keep working. We have to change pilots and planes for them. But they're working harder than paying the pilots. I think, um, yeah, even the lot of infrastructure imperatives exist and they will continue to exist exist at the rate this um, country is going. It's about how we overcome these infrastructure imperatives and still succeed. Um, at Jetsimco, when we took over a lot of our aircrafts, we flying about 20% of capacity. We've increased the capacity utilization of these planes to near 60 to 65% in some cases. We've demobilized aircraft from, you know, there's a huge concentration of planes in Bombay, Delhi, and Bangalore, but demands coming out of Vijayawada and uh, Hyderabad and Mobile and Nagpur. We've actually demobilized these planes, put them there, we've stopped blocking some airports as cost of the agreement. Started using some airports which had a lot of empty space. Made private flying cheaper for customers. You know, I, um, you make fun of me, I was late this morning, I was having breakfast with a customer. And uh, he told me, can I reduce my private jet bill by 47%? And you increase my flying by 20%. So we've done for a corporate house, but um, at the same time, you know, I've always had this dream of putting on every person possible on the table. And if you go onto our website today, you can fly from Delhi at 2,100 rupees. Today, there were six seats, which is lower than what you quoted on uh, NLI to be also. So what we're trying
having said, um, yes, India is definitely not ready for the big private jet wave to happen. Apollo has 900 helicopters alone. You know, I'm famous in the ministry for saying this again and again and again, but all of India doesn't have 200 helicopters. And that to mostly on offshore rigging from Mumbai. Exactly. 60% of my helicopters used for offshore. So, today when, you know, an industrialist wants to go from home to office on a helicopter, you really can't do it because you've got the Navy in the way, you've got the government in the way, you've got someone, someone, someone. Then we finally go and clog up airports. You know, we take up big aircraft base for helicopters. So it's not the airport developers fault or the AI's fault. It, you know, it's, it's a general problem where if everyone doesn't combine together to see what is the most optimum, you know, mode of transportation one can achieve, and what you have to do to enable it. Our mission always needs to, uh, you know, get people to travel the fastest way possible from point A to point B. We are currently exploring flight cars in the company in Germany. My biggest worry is even if I do get a flight car into India, will I ever be allowed to fly it? You know, uh, it's a reality. It's just another cost, $120,000. The operating cost is about 30,000 rupees an hour. And I can get you from, uh, I think, Algeria to South Bombay in about 20 minutes. I've been to test the for you, I've been to test the airports, helipads, everything. But are we ready as a country to, you know, even accept the fact that flying cars are a reality? You know, most, most people in this room will get me like, what is she talking about? I guess let's get the helicopters in first. Exactly. And then comes the flying cars. I mean, just share something with the audience about uh, fractional ownership. This is something which happens all over the world. which actually brings down the cost of ownership and risks. Uh, you see that happening because there's an unproved, there's some fair decision, but if it's we don't come to the so, you know, surprisingly, um, most aircraft owners in the United States of America own aircraft for the tax benefit that they get. You know, they don't buy planes just to use them because they're really expensive. But there are about 41,000 private jets in America. Again, there are about 150 in India. You know, stark disparity. India gives you the same tax benefits. But the primary difference is in America, four people they own a plane and, you know, split the tax benefit by four. In India, five people they own the plane, but only one takes home the tax benefit, which is a little strange because you know five people are investing twenty million dollars. They've got to get the tax benefit that uh, everyone deserves. Currently, we were trying to restructure a company, you know, where we were trying to um, pass on the tax benefit to the holding company, and we were told you can't do that. But the recent one now, JetLT has also taken the taxation from twenty percent to twenty eight plus three thirty one percent. Is that a death knell? I don't budget? think so. You know why? Because um, it's GST. Every company buying a plane has a GST input credit. Well, these are private, for private jets. Oh yeah, private jets. As a private person, suppose yeah. uh, Kiran goes for his fourth or fifth private jet. I mean, he can't claim a... He can't claim a... <coughs> so, you know, that's another uh, thing. In India, you can't claim a... Uh, set off on private jets under the private category. So if you're buying a plane only to use yourself and you don't want to share it with anyone else, it's complete debt for you in India because I think they're about to... <coughs>
between uh, Kiran Rao and between uh, Dinesh they come and say and what baffles me most of you know, every year they say that in the next 20 years we'll have so many aircraft and the figure just changes by 10 or 15 aircraft and I keep wondering I say, how can you see the same figure and sustain it every 20 years year after year why not a 10 year figure but nonetheless the growth is bound to be there and I think uh, if we look at what these people have done and what we've seen in Airbus in the last 15 years. Airbus and Ashwabe is barely started with that first order of Indian Airlines that we got a 43 aircraft. And then after that, Deccan came. And I was a part of that team that sat with Gobi and we did that at you know, Aeropid thing. And it worked very well. I mean, we're not getting the reason why somebody came, why somebody didn't come and uh, or survive. If you take the case of uh, the first onslaught of airlines after privatization and came and east west and jet and all came. They all started, the mania came. There has been some remnant and I think the people who stayed back are the ones who showed the tenacity. Then came the second flush. In the second flush again, you know, jet survived, Deccan came, Zara came, they sold out, Kingfisher came, they went out, Indigo came, Spice survived, went through the whole round, and then of course more than that coming up. And I strongly believe that while we move on and the infrastructure will keep coming up and developing and the number that company keeps saying they will keep flying, there is a potential for one more disruptive stuff. Like Indigo, they always had that statement that you know we will have only one model, one airline, one aircraft. But the, the disruption came and the India has come, which is not what they were thought. So similarly, I guess in about 10 years time, we will see some more things happening, like you talk of FBI. And I would be surprised if you know people from overseas, because today the aviation industry is partly the, the endeavoring spirit of people, partly the financing. If you see the airline that have not survived, it's purely because of you know wrong financing planning. So if you get a lot of FDRs coming in, FDIs coming from outside, either through investors or through airlines. We will have one more flight and there will be the scope for one or two more airlines to come. And that's uh, what I would like. Also, just uh, touch upon uh, the Make in India program. Maybe. When can we have the first aircraft made out of? I know it's a touchy question. Not no, why well, we have a lot of faith. The first, first full Airbus yeah. 320 high China made yeah. out of India. Somebody mentioned about China. And uh, I remember even the order that we got from the Chinese government. This is again the government is saying, and I think the present government has a vision very clear, but the time scale is not in their hand because of a lot of political uh, issues that are coming up. Now, uh, if you take the government in China, they take a quick decision because they run the industry differently. They gave us an order of 250 aircraft and said the condition is to make it here. So we set up a factory in Tian then started making it. And they are not developing their own aircraft. But that's the government policy. Over here, we have offered the Air Force to replace the Avro the aging Avro aircraft, the C295. C295 is coming. We have promised that okay, we will close the factory in Spain, bring it here, set it up, give you those 60 aircraft that you want, 15 fly by 45 to be made here. And then that is as a global marketing will take place. Even our Eurocopter, similar business to the Rocky, but I think the government is yet to give the go ahead. So well, Inshallah, I mean, should get the orders very, very soon and we have big parties. Okay, uh, we just got another two, three minutes left. So, yeah, uh, the gentleman in the front here. My only request would be humble request, keep it very, very short because I'm getting very nasty signals from behind. Sure. So, there are two questions. One is, uh, do you see in the next five or ten years the Indian carriers dominating the skies here in terms of the policy for foreign direct investment? And the second thing is that today it's a great time when you're optimistic.
issues like oil, which has an impact positively or negatively, or other supply side constraints, uh, it could positively impact. But I think 8 to 10% is something that is doable even with the constraints that we have. Anything above is a factor on, on macroeconomic factors, uh, commodity prices, infrastructure, and our supply side. But around 10%, in India, with 400 aircraft committed, that's total. Uh, um, I would say 15 20 is what I see in budget. But even if oil goes up to 100, uh, around 10% is, is something that I would think that is a normal sector of growth. We have seen those uh, eight to four, one ten to nine growth in number below 10%. Yes. Exactly. So we've seen the worst when uh, see the beauty is uh, that uh, the government was very smart when it came down from 110 to over 40 million dollars. The government did not uh, make the, the ATF one third. The ATF came down only by 20 30 percent. So from the high 70s it came into the late 40s or early 50, 50 rupees per meter. So I think that's safely pushed. And the moment even if the oil price goes, say, uh, inshallah, I mean, God forbid, if it goes beyond 60, I guess there is a little play that the government has in the growth. It's more than covered up so they can reduce the taxes a little and keep the oil prices within that range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. take one last question. In fact, I was wondering, uh, Lord Desai, if you can put you on the spot, if you want to share some thoughts. You've seen the whole world, frequent fire. Can you get a quick uh, mic here, please, in the front? Yeah. The mic's right there. Not this side.